Watch us on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast and support us on Patreon. Thanks for stopping by. He had a remarkable penetration into character. Once a valuable necklace was stolen from Chi Wan, who was living in honorable widowhood with her children in the same house as Plotinus, the servants were called before him. He scrutinized them all, then indicated one. This man is the thief. The man was whipped but for some time persisted in denial. Finally, however, he confessed and restored the necklace. Plotinus foretold also the future of each of the children in the household. For instance when questioned as to Pullman's character and destiny he said, he will be amorous and short-lived, and so it proved. I at one period had formed the intention of ending my life. Plotinus discerned my purpose. He came unexpectedly to my house where I had secluded myself, told me that my decision sprang not from reason, but mere melancholy, and advised me to leave Rome. I obeyed and left for Sicily, which I chose because I heard that one Probus, a man of scholarly repute, was living there not far from Lilibium. Thus I was induced to abandon my first intention, but was prevented from being with Plotinus between that time and his death. Emperor Gallienus and his wife Salonina greatly honored and venerated Plotinus, who thought to turn their friendly feeling to some good purpose. In Campania there had once stood, according to tradition, a city of philosophers, a ruin now. Plotinus asked the emperor to rebuild the city and to make over the surrounding district to the new-founded state. The population was to live under Plato's laws. The city was to be called Platonopolis. Plotinus undertook to settle down there with his associates. He would have had his way without more ado, but that opposition at court, prompted by jealousy, spite, or some such paltry motive, put an end to the plan. At the conferences, he showed the most remarkable power of going to the heart of a subject, whether in exposition or explanation, and his phrasing was apt, but he made mistakes in certain words. For example, he said anamnemiskatai for anamnemiskatai just such errors as he committed in his writing. When he was speaking his intellect visibly illuminated his face, always of winning presence, he became at these times still more engaging, slight moisture gathered on his forehead, he radiated benignity. He was always as ready to entertain objections as he was powerful in meeting them. At one time I kept interrogating him during three days as to how the soul is associated with the body, and he continued explaining, a man called Thaumatius entered amid our discussions. The visitor was more interested in the general drift of the system than in particular points, and said he wished to hear Plotinus expounding some theory as he would in a set treatise, but that he could not endure Porphyry's questions and answers. Plotinus asked, but if we cannot first solve the difficulties, Porphyry raises what could go into the treatise. In style Plotinus is concise, dense with thought, terse, more lavish of ideas than of words, most often expressing himself with a fervid inspiration. He followed his path rather than that of tradition, but in his writings, both the Stoic and Peripatetic doctrines are sunk. Aristotle's metaphysics, especially, is condensed in them, all but entire. He had a thorough theoretical knowledge of geometry, mechanics, optics, and music, though it was not in his temperament to go practically into these subjects. At the conferences he used to have treatises by various authors read aloud among the Platonists, it might be Severus of Cronius, Numenius, Gaius, or Atticus, and among the peripatetics Aspasius, Alexander, Adrastus, or some such writer, at the call of the moment. But it was far from his way to follow any of these authors blindly. He took a personal, original view, applying a monious method to the investigation of every problem. He was quick to absorb. A few words sufficed him to make clear the significance of some profound theory, and so to pass on. After hearing Longinus work on causes and his antiquary, he remarked, Longinus is a man of letters, but in no sense a philosopher. One day Origen came to the conference room. Plotinus blushed deeply, and was on the point of bringing his lecture to an end 
When Arjen begged him to continue, he said, the zest dies down when the speaker feels that his hearers have nothing to learn from him. Once on Plato's feast, I read a poem, The Sacred Marriage. My piece abounded in mystic doctrine conveyed in veiled words and was couched in terms of enthusiasm. Someone exclaimed, Porphyry has gone mad. Plotinus said to me so that all might hear, you have shown yourself at once poet, philosopher, and hierophant. The orator Diophanes one day read a justification of the Alcibiades of Plato's banquet and maintained that the pupil, for the sake of advancement in virtue, should submit to the teacher without reserve, even to the extent of carnal commerce. Plotinus started up several times to leave the room, but forced himself to remain. On the breaking up of the company he directed me to write a refutation. Diophanes refused to lend me his address, and I had to depend on my recollection of his argument. But my refutation, delivered before the same audience, delighted Plotinus so much that during the very reading he repeatedly quoted, so strike and be a light to men. When Eubulus, the Platonic successor, wrote from Athens, sending treatises on some questions in Platonism. Plotinus had the writings put into my hands with instructions to examine them and report to him upon them. He paid some attention to the principles of astronomy, though he did not study the subject very deeply on the mathematical side. He went more searchingly into horoscopy. When once he was convinced, that its results were not to be trusted he had no hesitation in attacking the system frequently both at the conferences and in his writings. Many Christians of this period amongst them sectaries who had abandoned the old philosophy, men of the schools of Adelphius and Aquilinus had possessed themselves of works by Alexander of Libya, by Philochemus, by Demonstratus, and by Lydus, and exhibited also revelations bearing the names of Zoroaster, Zostrianus, Nicotheus, Alagenes, Mises, and others of that order. Thus they fooled many, themselves fooled first. Plato, according to them, had failed to penetrate the depth of intellectual being. Plotinus frequently attacked their position at the conferences, and finally wrote the treatise, which I have headed against the Gnostics. He left to us of the circle the task of examining what he passed over. Amelius proceeded as far as a fortieth treatise in refutation of the book of Zostrianus. I have shown on many counts that the Zoroastrian volume is spurious and modern, concocted by the sectaries to pretend that the doctrines they had embraced were those of the ancient sage. Some of the Greeks began to accuse Plotinus of appropriating the ideas of Nemenius. Amelius, being informed of this charge by the Stoic and Platonist Trypho, challenged it in a treatise, which he entitled The Difference Between the Doctrines of Plotinus and Nemenius. He dedicated the work to me, under the name of Basilius, or King. This is my name, it is equivalent to Porphyry, purple-robed, and translates the name I bear in my tongue, for I am called Malchos, like my father, and Malchos would give Basilius in Greek. Longinus, in dedicating his work on impulse to Cleodemus and myself, addressed us as Cleodemus and Malchus, just as Nemenius translated the Latin Maximus into its Greek equivalent Megalos. Here followed Aemilius' letter. Aemilius to Basilius, with all good wishes. You have been, in your phrase, pestered by the persistent assertion that our friend's doctrine is to be traced to Nemenius of Apamea. Now, if it were merely for those illustrious personages who spread this charge, you may be very sure I would never utter a word in reply. It is sufficiently clear that they are actuated solely by the famous and astonishing facility of speech of theirs when they assert, at one moment, that he is an idle babbler, next to that he is a plagiarist, and finally that his plagiarisms are feeble in the extreme. Clearly in all this, we have nothing but scoffing and abuse. But your judgment has persuaded me that we should profit by this occasion firstly to provide ourselves with a useful memorandum of the doctrines that have won our adhesion, and secondly to bring about a more complete knowledge of the system long celebrated thought it be to the glory of our friend, a man so great as Plotinus. Hence I now bring you the promised reply, 
executed, as you and your self-knowledge, in three days. You must judge it with reasonable indulgence. This is no orderly and elaborate defense composed in step-by-step -step correspondence with the written indictment. I have simply set down, as they occurred to me, my recollections of our frequent discussions. You will admit, also, that it is by no means easy to grasp the meaning of a writer who, like Numenius, now credited with the opinion we also hold, varies in the terms he uses to express the one idea. If I have falsified any essential of the doctrine, I trust to your good nature to set me right. I am reminded of the phrase in the tragedy, a busy man and far from the teachings of our master I must need correct and recant. Judge how much I wish to give you pleasure, good health. This letter seemed worth insertion as showing, not merely that some contemporary judgment pronounced Plotinus to be parading on the strength of Numenius ideas, but that he was even despised as a word spinner. The fact is that these people did not understand his teaching. He was entirely free from all the inflated pomp of the professor, his lectures had the air of conversation and he never forced upon his hearers the severely logical substructure of his thesis. When I first heard him, had the same experience. It led me to combat his doctrine in a paper in which I tried to show that the intelligible exists outside of the intellectual principle. He had my work read to him by Emilius. In the end, he smiled and said, You must clear up these difficulties. Emilius, Porphyry doesn't understand our position. Amelius wrote a tract of considerable length in answer to Porphyry's objections. I wrote a reply to the reply. Amelius replied to my reply. At my third attempt I came, though even so with difficulty, to grasp the doctrine. Then only, I was converted, wrote a recantation, and read it before the circle. From that time on I was entrusted with Plotinus' writings and sought to stir in the master himself the ambition of organizing his doctrine, and setting it down in the more extended form. Amelius, too, under my prompting, was encouraged in composition. Longinus' estimate of Plotinus, formed largely upon indications I had given him in my letters, will be gathered from the following extract from one of his to me. He is asking me to leave Sicily and join him in Phoenicia, and to bring Plotinus works with me, he says, and send them at your convenience or, better, bring them. For I can never cease urging you to give the road towards us the preference over any other. If there is no better reason and what intellectual gain can you anticipate from a visit to us, at least there are old acquaintances, the mild climate, which would do you good in the weak state of healthy report. Whatever else you may be expecting, do not hope for anything new of my own, or even for the earlier works which you tell me you have lost, for there is a sad dearth of copyists here. I assure you it has taken me all this time to complete my set of Plotinus, and it was done only by calling off my scribe from all his routine work, and keeping him steadily to this one task. I think that now, with what you have sent me, I have everything, though in a very imperfect state, for the manuscript is exceeding faulty. I had expected our friend Emilius to correct the scribal errors, but he had something better to do. The copies are quite useless to me. I have been especially eager to examine the treatises on the soul and the authentic existent, and these are precisely the most corrupted. It would be a great satisfaction to me if you would send me faithful transcripts for collation and return though again I suggest to you not to send but to come in person, bringing me the correct copies of these treatises, and of any that Emilius may have passed over. All that he brought with him I have been careful to make my own. How could I be content not to possess myself of all the writings of a man so worthy of the deepest veneration? I repeat, what I have often said in your presence and your absence, as on that occasion when you were at Tyre, that while much of the theory does not convince me, Yet I am filled with admiration and delight over the general character of the work, the massive thinking of the man, the philosophic handling of problems. In my judgment investigators must class Plotinus' work with that holding the very highest rank. 20. This extended quotation from the most acute of the critics of our day a writer, 
who has passed judgment on nearly all his contemporaries serves to show the estimate he came to set upon Plotinus of whom, at first, misled by ignorant talk, he had held a poor opinion. His notion, by the way, that the transcripts he acquired from Aemilius were faulty sprang from his misunderstanding of Plotinus' style and phraseology, if there were ever any accurate copies. These were they, faithful reproductions from the author's manuscript. Another passage from the work of Longinus, dealing with Aemilius, Plotinus, and other metaphysicians of the day, must be inserted here to give a complete view of the opinion formed upon these philosophers by the most authoritative and most searching of critics. The work was entitled On the End, in answer to Plotinus and Gentilianus Aemilius, it opens with the following preface. In our time, Marcellus, there have been many philosophers especially in our youth for there is a strange scarcity at present. When I was a boy, my parents' long journeys gave me the opportunity of seeing all the better known teachers, and in later life, those that still live became known to me as my visits to this and that city and people brought me where they happened to live. Some of these undertook the labor of developing their theories in formal works, and so have bequeathed to the future the means of profiting by their services. Others thought they had done enough when they had convinced their immediate hearers of the truth of their theories. First of those that have written, among the Platonists, there are Euclides, Democritus, Proclinus the philosopher of the Trode, and the two who still profess philosophy at Rome. Plotinus, and his friend Gentilianus Aemilius. Among the Stoics, there are Themistocles and Phoebion, and the two who flourished only a little while ago, Aeneas and Medius. And there is the peripatetic, Heliodorus of Alexandria. For those that have not written, there are among the Platonists Ammonius and Origen, two teachers whose lectures I attended during a long period, men greatly surpassing their contemporaries in mental power and there are the Platonic successors at Athens, Theodotus, and Eubulus. No doubt some writing of a metaphysical order stands to the credit of this group. Origen wrote on spirit beings, Eubulus on the Philebus and Gorgias, and the objections urged by Aristotle to Plato's Republic. But this is not enough to class either of them with systematic authors. This was side play, authorship was not in the main plan of their careers. Among Stoic teachers that refrained from writing we have Herminus and Lysimachus, and the two living in Athens, Musonius and Athenaeus, among Peripatetics, Ammonius and Ptolemaeus. The two last were the most accomplished scholars of their time, Ammonius especially being unapproached in breadth of learning, but neither produced any systematic work, we have from them merely verses and duty speeches. These I cannot think to have been preserved with their consent, they did not concern themselves about formal statement of their doctrine, and it is not likely they would wish to be known in after times by the compositions of so trivial a nature. To return to the writers, some of them, like Euclides, Democritus, and Proclinus, confined themselves to the mere compilation and transcription of passages from earlier authorities. Others diligently worked over various minor points in the investigations of the ancients, and put together books dealing with the same subjects. Such were Aeneas, Medius, and Phoebion, the last especially choosing to be distinguished for style rather than for systematic thinking. In the same class must be ranked Heliodorus. His writings contribute nothing to the organization of the thought which he found to his hand in the teaching of earlier workers. Plotinus and Gentilianus Aemilius alone display the true spirit of authorship, they treat a great number of questions, and they bring a method of their own to the treatment. Plotinus, it would seem, set the principles of Pythagoras and Plato in a clearer light than anyone before him. On the same subjects, Nemenius, Cronius, Moderatus, and Fursilus fall far short of him in precision and fullness. Aemilius set himself to walk in Plotinus' steps and adopted most of Plotinus' opinions. His method, however, was diffuse and, unlike his friend, he indulges in an extravagance of explanation. Only these two seem to be worth study.
What profit can anyone expect from troubling the works of any of the others to the neglect of the originals on which they drew? They bring us nothing of their own, not even a novel augment, much less a leading idea, and are too unconcerned even to set side by side the most generally adopted theories, or to choose the better among them. My method has been different, for example when I replied to Gentilianus upon Plato's treatment of justice, and in a review, I undertook of Plotinus' work on the ideas. This latter was in the form of a reply to Basilius of Tyre, my friend is theirs. He had preferred Plotinus' system to mine, and had written several works in the manner of his master, amongst them a treatise supporting Plotinus' theory of the idea against that which I taught. I endeavored, not, I think, unsuccessfully, to show that his change of mind was mistaken. In these two essays, I have ranged widely over the doctrines of this school, as also in my letter to Aemilius which, despite the simple title with which I contented myself, has the dimensions of a book, being a reply to a treatise he addressed to me from Rome under the title on Plotinus Philosophy. This is brought to you by The Praetorian, on both YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms, Anchor, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Spotify. Support us on Patreon. Check out our Discord server too. All the links are in the description below. Thanks for stopping by. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.